Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the guns they will be selling in their September of 2016 premiere auction. And I have a really cool intermediate evolutionary example of the Colt 1911 pistol, the famous government model, here to take a look at today. Specifically, this is a Colt model of 1907. So the story of these pistols kind of goes back to 1900, when John Browning sold Colt a uh, design for a uh, tipping barrel recoil operated pistol, uh, which would eventually become the 1911. Now this was originally in 38 caliber, and it went through several design iterations uh, before it got to this point. And if you're interested in those, I have an overview video of the whole production design history of the 1911, which I would recommend you take a look at. However, we're going to fast forward here. Um, the Colt model of 1905 was the first one in the 45 ACP cartridge, which was also incidentally developed by John Browning. And that Colt 1905 was submitted to the US government in 1906 when they requested 45 caliber pistol designs. There were, in total, there were 18 different uh, entrants to this, this series of uh, pistol tests, this pistol competition. They included companies from all over the world. All the pretty much all the major players and a lot of minor players in the firearms industry at the time entered submissions. And one of those was the Colt model of 1905. Now, they all went through testing, and the 1905 Colt did quite well. It was one of the best guns in the trial. However, the government came up with a number of changes that they would want made to the gun. The most substantial one being the Colt 1905 has literally no manual safety to it. Doesn't have a grip safety, doesn't have a thumb safety, doesn't have a magazine safety, got nothing. Um, you carry it with the hammer down, and it's interesting, actually, the way this is designed with the hammer down, even hitting the back of the hammer can't cause the gun to fire. So it is safe in that configuration. Uh, but once you start doing some shooting, and uh, let's say you fire half the magazine, and you want to then restore the pistol to a safe carrying condition, there isn't really a good way to do it. So. Uh, the government requested that Colt add a grip safety to the gun. Remember, this is going to be used uh, not just for infantry, but also for the cavalry. And a grip safety was a nice, easy, simple safety, automatic safety, basically, for the cavalry to use. So that was the main request. And along with this was a request to manufacture 200 of these guns for field trials. Now, this is the exact gun that would have been competing directly with the 45 caliber Savage at the same time. The Savage was also one of the best guns in the trial, and 200 Savages were purchased for field trials at the same time. Now, these field trial guns were produced in 1908, and they were sent out to a variety of different cavalry troops for testing. Basically, here, take 50 of these pistols and play with them for a while and tell us what you think and try not to shoot yourself. Now, one of the first reports that came back on these pistols was actually from the School of Musketry. They'd only gotten a couple of the guns, but they went out and did some endurance and reliability trials with them. And boy, the guys at the School of Musketry really were not automatic pistol fans. These were revolver guys, through and through. They didn't like automatic pistols. They didn't really know how to use automatic pistols, and they complained left and right about all sorts of things. Uh, it's interesting to read this report because it's really this mixture of legitimate criticism, there were some problems with these guns, and also this kind of cringe-inducing prejudice, really. So they complained you couldn't shoot them accurately because of the grip safety. This whole push in on the grip safety and pull back with the trigger was apparently very confusing. Uh, they didn't like the recoil. Uh, they were used to shooting their 38 caliber revolvers, and well, 45 has more recoil than a 38 revolver. And you know, the, the reply from Colt on that point was very succinct. It was, yes, 45 does in fact recoil more than 38. They didn't say it, but the subtext is, we're sorry, but you're getting a lot more bang out of the pistol, and maybe if you can't handle that, you shouldn't be in the cavalry. Anyway, um, the legitimate problems that came up with the model of 1907 here uh, were breakages of the sear, and Colt went back and revised the sear design and made it a bit beefier. And they really had these persistent reliability problems. They would jam on feeding, mostly, and also jam on ejecting. And the, there was back and forth correspondence between the different cavalry troops and the schools and the Colt company. And basically, Colt kept saying, these work fine, they're fine, they work great, we have no problems with them. And these guys in the field kept having problems with them. Eventually, in 1909, Colt actually arranged to bring the pistols back in batches and make some retrofits to them. 
And one of the substantial retrofits they made was to enlarge the ejection port. And that seems to have actually legitimately gotten rid of that problem. After they did that, the guns ran much more reliably. And some of these cavalry guys were starting to come around to the idea of an automatic pistol. Uh, some of the reports do talk about how, you know, if we can get them running reliably, they really would be a fantastic weapon. Uh, they still continued to complain that it required two hands to reload the gun. Again, Colt pretty much said, yes, all automatic pistols require two hands to reload. But So all in all, these trials were a bit of a mixed bag, but generally positive for Colt. Uh, the guns did have some problems, and there was a lot of prejudice against the very concept in the U.S. military at the time. But th they did perform pretty well, and they managed to revise a lot of, the, ish a lot of the, the features that were causing problems and get the guns working quite well by the end. Uh, ultimately, these guns were handed back in. They, they had only been sent out for troop trials. They weren't intended to be issue firearms for these cavalry troops. And by December of 1911, all the guns had come back to Springfield, or most of them, uh, in total, about, well, 205 of these were, were purchased by the Army. Uh, five of them, interestingly, were presentation cased and, and uh, engraved with a shooter's name, and they were used as uh, marksmanship competition prizes. Kind of interesting. Um, I believe only one of those is known to still exist today. Anyway, there were then 200 of the standard pistols, like this one, that were sent out. Uh, 185 of those came back to Springfield. Presumably, the other 15 had been scavenged for parts and or simply rendered uh, inoperable in field trials and discarded. They took a look at those when they came back, and they were considering refurbishing them or not. Uh, the original cost for these had been $25 a piece. It would have cost five bucks each to go through and refurbish them and get them back into really nice condition, you know, refinish them and all that sort of thing. And Springfield looked at that cost and decided there wasn't really any reason to. So they ended up selling them as a single batch. Uh, the high bidder on that was the Bannerman Company of New York, who bought these pistols for $1,644.44 for 185 of the guns and about 200 spare magazines and a few other accessories. Uh, Bannerman would then go on to sell them individually after that. Bannerman was at the time this huge surplus firearms behemoth in New York, buying and selling all sorts of military surplus. Bannerman could literally equip an entire small nation's military if, they, if necessary. So, uh, and Bannerman is where a lot of these pistols came back from. So not just Colt 1907s, but other interesting trial pistols from the US military. All right, so here's our 1907. A uh, couple of things. First, the grip safety is the main uh, differentiator of the 1907 with the other uh, steps in this pistol evolution. Now, it's interesting to point out that not everything on this gun was straight John Moses Browning. Uh, what Browning typically did was design, he came up with a patent, a basic operating idea. He sold that to a company, in this case Colt, and then uh, engineers for that company would spend some time refining the design and turning it into a marketable product. So in this case, there were two guys at Colt, uh, Carl Ebbets and George Tansley, who actually designed a couple of different grip safeties. The version they ended up using on this pistol combined elements from both of those patents. So you'll see this is a very small grip safety. This is something that was complained about in several different reports, that the grip safety requires pressure right up here, which isn't necessarily natural. It's very easy to um, get a grip on this pistol and fire it without actually depressing the grip safety. It's a little stiff, not too bad, but it really would have been better if it had been wider or longer. And they didn't ever do that on the 1907, uh, nor the 1909 model that followed, but of course if you look at the model of 1911, you'll see the grip safety is the full width, just about, of this backstrap, and it's much easier to depress. One of the other military requests had been to add a loaded chamber indicator. They were concerned that there was no way externally to tell if the gun was loaded or not. This particular pistol is missing that uh, indicator, but the pins there and the slots there. Once again, this was not something that Browning actually did himself. The loaded chamber indicator was designed and patented by a guy named James Peard, who was also working for Colt at the time. If we take a look at the markings here, of course on the right side we have automatic Colt. Uh, caliber 45 rimless smokeless, the early, early way that they described 45 ACP. Uh, rimless telling you that it is not one of the revolver cartridges, and of course smokeless meaning it's not black powder. We've got more on this side. This gun is serial number 66. Uh, we do know from the records that this one was issued to Troop H of the 2nd Cavalry for testing. That's kind of cool. 
and then the KM here is the, the US military inspectors mark. That KM specifically is Major Kenneth Morton who inspected and approved this pistol. There is a lanyard loop here at the bottom. You'll notice what they did was simply cut the right hand grip a little bit shorter and staple this lanyard ring to the side of it. Like the, uh, the 1905 and the earlier, in fact all of the earlier Colt designs, this pistol still has a heel magazine release. There's a slot in the magazine right there. Other than that, it looks very much like what we would expect today for a, a 1911 magazine. Holds seven rounds. This is our slide stop or slide release and there is no thumb safety on this pistol. So there it is locked open. Press that down to drop the slide. And of course we have uh, Colt's manufacturing mark and the patent dates here on the left. Now I mentioned the improvements made in 1909. The ejection port here was initially cut at kind of a, a slope right in there. And in 1909 they squared it off and opened it up like that, which definitely improved the reliability of the pistols. In addition, in order to uh, uh, satisfy some of the other complaints about things like the hammer biting, they added this little bit of a tail to the grip safety. This is nowhere near as substantial, well it's close to as substantial as you'd see on a standard 1911. Of course many shooters today prefer a much wider beaver tail grip, uh, grip safety. But the original ones actually had nothing there. It was just, just like that. Now one other element I do want to show you is the operating mechanism. These still use the twin link system that was used on the Colt 1905 and all of the iterations earlier. So to disassemble it we have to pull this stop wedge out. So to do that I'm going to push on this plunger which relieves spring tension on the wedge. I can pull that out. Pull the magazine. And then I can just slide the, the slide straight off the back of the gun. This is one of the primary potential safety complaints about this gun is that should this piece either fall out or break you do actually have the potential for the slide to come straight off the back of the gun and hit the shooter. Uh, in fact, one of the guys in the testing had that happen to him. There, there's a complaint at one point that they say that this worked, it worked loose and fell out during a course of fire and the slide came off and hit one of the recruits in the chin. Now presumably it wasn't going all that fast at the time. There's no mention that it actually injured him, but it certainly wouldn't, wouldn't be a pleasant experience. Now as I mentioned, this is a twin link design meaning that there's a link here and a link here. So where the 1911 barrel is, has a link only at the back and pivots at the front, so the barrel actually tips, the earlier guns, everything up to 1907 here, the barrel actually recoils, it, it remains parallel to the original bore axis and simply drops down and backwards without tilting. Uh, so interestingly, before the 1909 testing was even complete, Browning was already working on improving this system. And he would, the model of 1909 has the, w the, the operating mechanism that we would see today, where it's got a bushing in the front and the barrel stays in place in the front and it just has a pivot in the back. So he was, he was kind of working ahead of Army testing in improving this design. And this is the last variant that has this twin link system. Uh, you will find it also in the Colt 1903 pocket hammer, as well as the 1900, 1902, and 1905 automatic pistols. Thanks for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. It's very cool. This is one of the developmental iterations in the 1911 that I hadn't gotten a chance to get my hands on before now. So now I have, we get to take a look at it, see this particular item. And uh, well, if you'd like to add it to your own 1911 collection, it is coming up for sale. Check out the link in the description text below. That'll take you to Rock Island's catalog page on it where you can see their pictures and their description and uh, place a bid online or by phone or come up here and participate in the auction live. Thanks for watching.